Very good evening to all the wonderful ladies and gentlemen watching this. Um, all the segments that have gone by have been wonderful, but if there has been one segment that I've been waiting for, it's this segment. You know, uh, and the reason why I'm waiting for this segment is, is two reasons. One is there are thunderstorms that are taking place in, in the media today in India, but at the same point in time, I think there are a lot of thunderstorms taking place in Mumbai city. Uh, the second reason, Delhi, which was having perfectly great weather is now a place that you can't step out. Uh, there is such bad air quality in Delhi that it's become impossible to step out. You, of course, understanding what I'm hinting at, it is the fact that climate change is a crisis that we must solve. Uh, today, to discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time, I have two people whom I greatly revere and admire. One person who has served the UN for almost 10 to 15 years and before that in various international organizations and his work on climate crisis spans over four decades. Uh, the other person, of course, is a Bollywood superstar. So she doesn't need much of an introduction, but let me start with the good lady on the panel. Uh, she's an actor, a cause ambassador for One Week World, One World Initiative that we took saying that, you know, one week, one day is not enough. Uh, let's let's celebrate one week of, for the environment. She's also a climate warrior and has done tons of things when it comes to climate change. She's somebody who's using her fame and popularity for good. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us, Sunakshi Sina. Thank you so much, Rishabh. You're too kind. And and and. The second panelist that we have today with us is somebody who's again, uh, like I did mention, is really special because he served with uh, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. He was the former Assistant Secretary General of the UN. He has been a part of the World Council of Churches and is greatly credited for making climate change a priority under the former SG. Um, His Excellency Janos Pasta, if I've got that right, uh, welcome to IMUN. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being part of this conversation and I look forward to it. So let me, let me start uh, with, with the conversation with the first question that I have actually, uh, which is, you know, global temperatures world, worldwide, the temperature has gone up by about 1.14 degrees Celsius. From the 1890s to today, 2016 was the hottest year yet. We've lost about 28 trillion tons of ice between 1994 and 2020. And it is said that the water levels may rise up to about three feet by the end of the century. Today, we live in a world where everyone puts their country first and then everything else. The United Nations is yet, however, dependent on different member states. But the problem uh, is the fact, and this, this is the first question that I wanted to ask and, uh, to Mr. Janos first, if that's all right. I wanted to ask him saying, in a country first world, the United Nations, how will it navigate the problem of climate change being a hoax? Because so many of the countries that fund the UN uh, do not necessarily believe in the fact, their world leaders do not, uh, the, the leaders that lead these countries do not believe in the fact that climate change is even real. Uh, how do you think the United Nations should navigate this, is my first question. Well, thank, thank you for this. This is really important. So first, let's be very clear about the science. This is not a hoax. There is overwhelming scientific evidence through analysis, through modeling, and increasingly through observing the real and current impacts of climate change. Uh, look at the, you mentioned yourself, the excessive heat in Delhi, and there are many other places in the Arctic. Look at the loss of glaciers in the Himalayas and the Alps. Look at the uh, forest fires in Australia and in California, Indonesia, and, and the list can go on. So the impacts are here. And just tell the people who are impacted, who lost their homes, who lost their livelihoods, that it's a hoax. It is not. So there is clearly scientific evidence. Now, let's also be clear that most of the governments in the world, most of the nations in the world, accept that climate change is real and it's serious and that humanity needs to do something about it. There are some governments who don't. There are some who have left, for example, the Paris Agreement, and there are some leaders who are against this, but on the whole, the majority of the countries are for it. So, and let's also be clear about that, that there are climate deniers out there, those who deny that climate change is a problem, and most of them are either part of the fossil fuel industry themselves or are funded by the fossil fuel industry. So, 
Uh, let's just be very clear once and for all, this is a serious issue and most of the world is behind uh, to try to find solutions. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And like you rightly said that many of these people who are these world leaders, so to say world leaders who do not believe in climate change are part of the cause of the climate changing. Uh, coming, coming to Sunakshi, Sunakshi, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, what do you think the United Nations should do in order to navigate this problem? Firstly, uh, I'm going to speak as a layperson, uh, just as someone who really feels passionate about uh, what we're talking about, which is climate change. And I want to be one of the champions who contributes to saving our planet, the only planet that we have. Uh, having said that, I'm just going to be really blunt and honest and go ahead and say that, you know, anybody who claims that climate change is a hoax has to be on a whole different level of stupid. Because even a five-year-old child today would be able to tell you that we're in trouble. And honestly, uh, you know, if you don't see it happening around you, like, like uh, Mr. Pastor said that, you know, we have uh, uh, ice sheets melting, glaciers melting, sea levels rising, the sea is getting acidic, we have uh, uh, coral reefs bleaching out, dying, um, it's getting hotter, carbon dioxide in the air, we're trapping greenhouse gases. Uh, everything's just getting hotter and, you know, it, it's just, it's just blatantly out there for everyone to see. And we're all suffering. Not one person is exempted from, you know, climate change. It affects each and every one of us. So honestly, I feel like, you know, working with countries that um, really go out on a limb to fight against this, to uh, create an awareness, uh, I think, I think attacking people on an individual level, rather than going through governments, attacking the youth with the information, with the awareness uh, about climate change and global warming and, you know, the dangers that we're in, I think would be a better approach. I think individually we're about what, uh, almost 8 billion, 8 billion people in the world today. Imagine if everyone just woke up one day and decided to plant a tree we'd be living in a different world. So I think going uh, the individual way would be better rather than, uh, that's, that's my opinion entirely. And I think, and I think that's, that's a great answer. You're, you're very candid. You speak your mind. And honestly, that's why young people, not just in India, but across the world, look up to you. And I'm glad that, that, that you're using your voice to bring about and effect positive change. Honestly, uh, like, I, like I said at the start, it's, it's a pleasure uh, and an honor that, that, uh, to have you here and to have you say the things that you are saying because it makes so much sense. And when you say them, unlike when I say them, people actually listen. Uh, but <laughs> well, you get us on the platform, Rishabh. So thank you. You give us, you give us a platform to reach out to so many uh, more people, you know. So thank you for that. And that's, that's, that's very kind of you. And let me, let me take you, uh, because you mentioned this very pertinent point that, you know, you must engage with uh, civil society, with young people in order to solve the problem of climate change. Uh, don't do an only government approach. My, my next question, actually, um, interestingly, is, is this, that, you know, the positives of the pandemic, one of the biggest positives of the pandemic was that there was clean air. You know, 7 million people approximately die due to air pollution. Now, during the lockdown, the air quality index in Delhi fell from 307 to 53. And now it's gone up back to 286 and even further. Uh, the problem is that at an individual level, people want to bring about change. But when 15.3 billion trees are felled across the world, um, the, the problem remains that what can individual efforts do when, what, what can individuals do in terms of their efforts when it comes to climate change as a whole, because whether you see, uh, you know, whether you see uh, Chile or whether you see uh, Trieste in Italy, there have been great positives during the pandemic. But the problem is that uh, people as individuals can do only as much. The United Nations and international organizations uh, do much more. Now, in, in such a scenario, my question to uh, uh, His Excellency Janos Pasta is that what can people do uh, at an individual level in order to tackle this problem? Okay, well, well, thank you. So first of all, I think let's let's uh, leave the His Excellency aside. Let's just uh, <laughs> my name is Janos and just call me Janos. So that that will be easier for our our discussion. Uh, secondly, I, I I agree very much with what Sonakshi said earlier that. Uh, 
it's so important to have individual action. But at the same time, I think it's really important that uh, at the end of the day, it's very difficult to get everybody, all the 8 billion people in the world, to do what needs to be done. And in order to get everybody on board, we do need laws, regulations, and government action. So if the challenge is not whether we need one or the other, we need both, and we need a lot more individual action, and then we need to make sure that it's reinforced by laws and regulations. Now, those will have to be done by governments, local or national, or even at the international level. And I'm afraid uh, it also has to include some of those vested interests that are probably trying to hold on and say, no, no, let's not change, let's not cut our fossil fuel emissions because we need to make use of fossil fuels. So we have to find ways to fight them. And, and that's where also individuals and civil society organizations can be extremely helpful because what it, I mean, their role on the one hand is, is so important to hold a different stakeholders to account, hold the governments to account, but hold also the private sector to account. There are some oil and gas companies that are saying, oh, we're going to be turning into low carbon. Are they really turning into low carbon? Can we check that and can we publicize what they're actually doing? So I, I think the idea is to have this, this combination of individual action, civil society engagement, and then working through governmental and intergovernmental processes uh, to make sure that laws and regulations are passed, that all, together we reach what we need to reach. Uh, that's 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 a very diplomatic way of putting it but but uh, if if i may if i may probe uh, this one a little further because i i notice that civil society and young people and more specifically people like sunakshi are doing as much as they can um, uh, you know mr janos but the problem is that when it comes to intergovernmental cooperation when it comes to governments putting those laws it's almost an impossible uh, thing and it's it's always the the politics comes in the way the bureaucracy the red tapeism comes in the way of effective legislation and whether it be mumbai or like i said whether it be santiago or whether it be trieste you we've seen dolphins uh, in and around across creatures we've, we've never seen before, like pumas, I think, were spotted in a few places across the world. Uh, it was, the, the, the lockdown was so positive. But post the lockdown, things have again got normalized. Um, it's good rhetoric and it's good talk. But when it comes to real re legislation, we hardly find it. And do you think that the UN should do a little more or can do a little more, given the fact that member states are, uh, you know, members, the, the UN is at the end of the day made up of member states only. So do you think the UN can do a little more than what it's doing? Or do you think uh, it's civil society and young people that need to bridge the gap? I'm, I'm sorry, I'll just give this to Mr. Janos uh, once again, and I'll come back sure. to you on this. So look, look, I, I, I think, first of all, everybody has to do more. Uh, governments need to do more, the UN needs to do more, and individual needs to do more. Why? Because we're in deep crisis. Uh, the, the climate crisis is really serious. So we all of us have to do more. Now, the question is, how do we do more? Now, we all know that it's very difficult to achieve uh, government decisions, even at the domestic level, let alone at the international level with 150, 200 to more countries uh, together. So uh, these are very hard. So. Uh, I, I suppose what, what I'm trying to say is that, that each different group of stakeholders have different roles to play. Governments, they need to come together and try to balance different interests. Now, if the interests of the youth are not represented through people like Sonakshi and through other youth representatives and so on, then they are not heard. So it is really important that the, 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 the youth and, and other important stakeholders are heard through people uh, that can represent their voices. And if there is enough of it, then, then there is a political force. And that's how policy changes. You need to have that political force. Now, I, I strongly believe, and I have seen results when, when civil society organizations, youth groups have pressed and have, have made their case that they can make a difference in the political process. But let's just be clear, it's never going to be easy. It's not gonna happen just like this. Tomorrow we'll solve all the problems. It has to be kept sustained pressure. Now, one more brief point that you said, and I, I'd like to maybe just mention this, we can come back to this later in the discussion. You talked about the, 
situation during COVID and, and how emissions were reduced and suddenly uh, wild animals were visible. I think we have to be a little bit careful here because we cannot solve the climate crisis by crashing the economy. If you crash the economy, people will have no salaries and they will suffer poverty and hunger and sickness and so on. So that is not a solution. Uh, but uh, but we, we have to find sustainable solutions where we can look at, do things differently with lower emissions. And there are possibilities, there are plenty of ideas. We can go into that in detail in the discussion if we have time. But there are plenty of ways in which we can do all the things we're doing in our societies, but with low or zero carbon emissions. Well, that's, that's, that's a great answer. You said that both civil society and, and governments must do uh, their bit. Let me come to Sonakshi and get her thoughts on this. What do you think? Uh, um, can, can individual people um, make a difference? Greta Thunberg is, of course, making a tremendous difference. But do you think young people and civil society alone can make a difference? Or do you think that the governments must come together as well and then effect change? Well, I think uh, Mr. Pastor knows way more about this than I ever will. So honestly, for me, I feel like he, he, he mentioned it quite clearly that, you know, it has to start on an individual level when everybody on an individual level begins to start moving towards a particular goal. I think the government policies are formed then. The government takes that in, so into consideration, takes that, uh, notices that, and I guess uh, finds ways to implement them in, in different ways. So I feel for me, I just believe that, you know, charity starts at home for every individual if they change particular habits, maybe two or three habits that, you know, are not in compliance with uh, uh, the environment. Uh, for example, I pledge to, you know, stop using plastic. I, I, I pledge to, you know, switch my toothbrush to a bamboo toothbrush uh, to, to conserve water wherever I can. Uh, little changes, you know, uh, probably change your diet twice or thrice a week. Uh, you know, uh, uh, adopting a vegetarian diet twice or thrice a week. Uh, small mm -hmm. things can go a really long way, you know, and on an individual level, if all of us just attempt even so much, I feel like, you know, we'll be moving in the right direction. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the bigger picture happens when the government does come in. So, uh, like I said, you know, to create an awareness uh, is most important and uh, the government will take action only when on an individual level everybody just gets together uh, and uh, you know does something about it. That is very, very, very rightly said you know you said that um, it's it's every drop in the ocean counts. And, Absolutely. Uh, the, in, the, individual, the individual also needs to start with uh, taking effort and it's charity starts at home and of course you're a great example of, of a climate warrior but um, both of you impressed upon the fact that how individuals should bring about change and like I said there are some young climate activists there are young people and just civil society that wants to do so much. Uh, now um, I want to take you to another point which is which is uh, the, the, the question is on the basis of what you've just mentioned which is in terms of individual action because whether you see Madrid, Bonn, Marrakesh, Rio, Kyoto, uh, whatever, whichever of these agreements you see, at the end of these agreements, the governments come together and say, this is what we feel that ABC should do in terms of the world as a whole. All these agreements are focused on multilateral action. The United Nations and, all its, uh, and also uh, organizations like the UN focus on country-specific action. In fact, even the SDG 13, uh, has more about country-specific action and global action as a whole in comparison to individual targets set for people. Now, how about this? How about having individual targets set for every young person? We as a country have about 600 million young people below the age of 35. Uh, and I think worldwide, the population of young people is only increasing. How about trying to tie up with schools, colleges, with civil society, cause ambassadors, and having global summits which, which involve them in comparison to having a Marrakesh and uh, to have a Bonn and a Montreal, which, which leads to great photo opportunities, but very little when it comes to uh, actual on-ground action. So my, my question to you is, uh, my, my, my question to, to Mr. Janos is they saying that, uh, how about setting more realistic goals on an individual level in comparison to having an SDG 13, which is a great initiative, but at the end of the day, it's a more country-specific initiative. 
That's a, it's a very good question. And let me, let me try and, and see how, how we can address this. So first of all, the UN is an intergovernmental body and it does what its member governments want it to do. And of course, they agree on what the governments should do in a multilateral setting. Now, and that's how the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, were developed and so on and so forth. And you're right, they don't say much about what individuals can do. And this is where I want to come back to what I mentioned earlier. Civil society organizations have a huge role to play, uh, whether it's youth-based or other uh, interest groups, uh, to say that the way we are going to implement the SDG 13, for example, the one on climate change, is that we're going to set ourselves individual goals. And there are clubs like this. There are organizations, uh, civil society organizations, that have set themselves a goal to limit their emissions, or as you said, uh, uh, to use bamboo toothbrushes and, and, and to, to not use plastic, to do little things, but ultimately those are very important in a collective way. So now, where I see a, a huge challenge for uh, civil society organizations, but also for the United Nations, is that one, the, the United Nations can and has always worked with civil society organizations in the past. The main partners are governments and civil society can come in as observers and there are different sets of activities. Now, where there is potential in the future is to bring together civil society organizations in a much more active and proactive way. And I see no reason why under the aegis of the United Nations, one couldn't have the kind of coalition of international, national civil society organizations that say, we're going to set ourselves a goal of reducing our emissions at home, individually. I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Uh, so these are things that are the different parts of the United Nations are beginning to, to work on those ideas. But again, it needs pressure. It needs pressure from individuals uh, and, and uh, civil society organizations. And that's why I think, Sonaxi, as I said at the beginning, people like yourselves have a really important role to play because you can say things and people will listen to you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I have, I have a few thousand followers on Twitter. You have <laughs> millions of people on, on your account. So uh, when you say something, lots of people listen. So I, I hope you can say some of these things and then people can actually engage and push and push governments and hold them accountable and push that that civil society organizations are prepared to act. Absolutely. That that is the goal. So. <laughs> that, that, that indeed is is the goal. And uh, she's she's been doing that for all our all our climate change campaigns. And I must I must tell you, Mr. Janos, we we uh, we at the organization are a small team of about 20 or 1,000 young boys and girls um, who actually, at the end of every conference, and there are about a crore students, that's about 10 million students who get impacted every year. What we did is we made every student plant a tree and only then issued a certificate. Um, and once they sent us a picture of that, only then did they get it. So whether it be for actually studying in the good universities or whether they believed in climate change, we tried to get them to uh, plant a tree. Of course, these ideas and many more come from good people such as Sonakshi who, who are associated to the organization, of course, not from somebody like me. But uh, let, me, let me take this question to, to Sonakshi. Sonakshi, you, uh, if you were the UN Secretary General for one day, <laughs> it, wow. <laughs> In charge. And Can I whoa, come and work whoa, for you? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, let's say all any which way tomorrow. I, I think when when uh, when tomorrow anybody would even glance upon glance upon uh, this clip, apart from all the all the hundred thousand who are watching it live today. Uh, when, when tomorrow anybody would see this from government or otherwise, I'm pretty confident that, that you'd, you'd make for a great choice for, for UN Secretary General. But let's hypothetically imagine that you are UN Secretary General for one day. What is it that you would do differently to save the planet? Um, I think firstly, I'd like to appoint a committee that... Uh, you know, really follows up on how every country is uh, working on the SDGs because ideally they have been formed, you know, for us, for our planet and for our future. 
So I think I would have that committee sorted. Uh, then I'd like to involve more individuals under the age of 30, 35, maybe 35, yeah, um, who, who, you know, are more connected to what the youth is thinking, saying, feeling. And uh, thirdly, this is something I think I've discussed with you before as well, Risha. But, you know, in school, we've, I, I've studied a couple of subjects that I have absolutely no use for at all right now. So I would like to introduce um, environmental preservation or reservation studies as a subject so that we can get it drilled into each and every child's head from the very beginning. You know, it, why, this, because it's something that is going to affect each and every person on the planet. There's, a, there's not one person who will not benefit from it. So I believe that instead of, you know, having a subject that might not be as useful to everyone, you know, once they're out of school, have something that will benefit each and every person, which is to how to preserve the environment and, you know, have some sort of future uh, when they get out of school. So, yeah, I think these are the three things that I would really like to do. Uh, how lovely. And uh, you said under 25 or under 35? Under 35 is good. Under, because I'd, no, I'd like to be in that I'm category. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, under 35 is good. You will nominate Sonakshi for the UN Secretary General and she'd be like, so uh, that boy Rishab, uh, who Rishab? Uh, that's Rishab Shah or Rish some Rishab? <laughs> You need to stop doing that to yourself. I know you very well by now, and you're and you're, and you're doing such great work. You need to stop uh, with the <laughs> putting yourself down. No, 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 no. But this is very, very kind of you. And 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 let me, uh, like I said, it's it's people such as you who help amplify what we do. Um, but let me take this question to Mr. Janos. Uh, you've been very close to the top. Uh, you've been advising former Secretary General Ban Ki Moon. You served as ASG in the UN. It's as high up as, as anyone could possibly get. Um, but let's hypothetically imagine that you were in the shoes of, of uh, then Ban Ki Moon and now His Excellency Antonio. Uh, what would you do differently as UN Secretary General? Well, okay. Well, first of all, if, if, if it's uh, Sonakshi, who is the Secretary General, I would love to work with her, even if, uh, <laughs> even if my age would probably exclude me uh, from the sort of the 25 to 35 category. But, uh, but you know, maybe as, a, as an advisor, you know, or something like that. So, so I would but, step down and make you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but, but if, if, if I do get a chance to, for one day, and it's just for one day, right? So because... Uh, then I would build on, on actually the second element that Sonakshi has already suggested is, is, um, is this business of bringing together uh, key people from this key group of 25 to 35 uh, of people who, I, you know, they're, they're grown up that they, they have their ideas about the world and, and they have their experiences in the world. And, and they, they are the ones who will soon be the leaders uh, of the world. So try to bring them together and, and have a massive global awareness raising event, uh, like what we're doing now, but in much bigger, uh, at, the, at the global level, bringing in the, all the media. And this is the kind of thing that the Secretary General can do. Secretary General has a huge convening power. So uh, let's bring uh, the, the, the youth representatives together. Let's bring the key media together. And let's talk really seriously about how a dire situation we're in. So being realistic, but at the same time being positive that there are solutions. There are solutions out there, and we can we can fix it. We can we can we can we can get this done, and and to to, to talk about all the good things that we're seeing out there. There are many good examples of of what can be done in terms of renewable energy, in terms of not using plastics, in terms of all those things. So let's bring all that together and let's show the world what is possible and how we can build on that to make it even better and really get to that, those goals uh, of the Paris Agreement, which is to keep the temperature rise to less than 1.5 degree centigrade globally, which is very challenging to do, but let's just show that it is possible. So that's, that's what I would do uh, just one day. 
Uh, yes, and, you know, if, if you give me another day, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk <laughs> about the long-term plans, okay? <laughs> Try to give the two of you one day each, but I was hypothetical. <laughs> question on behalf of all young people but let me let me uh, let me put the last question to the two of you the lockdown has been really positive for for the lockdown has been really positive for the environment i think it's been uh, greatly beneficial to combat climate change but mr janos i completely agree with you that you know you cannot do that at the cost of the economy but um, we celebrate the world environment day on 5th of june and let me tell you this, we started a small petition in our country um, where we got young people and people at large to sign saying that let's not celebrate the environment for one day, but let's try to celebrate it for one week. Now, um, in that one week, my question to you, Mr. Janos, is this, that instead of having just a celebration of the environment, why not keep the original habitants of the planet out and the, the secondary inhabitants of the planet in, which is human beings should be staying in, indoors and for one week we can have a worldwide lockdown. Uh, your thoughts on this? Because it's very important you, you speak, of course, as a, in an individual capacity, but again, this is a, a UN 75 initiative as well. So I would like to, I would love to hear from you what the United Nations thinks about this initiative. So I I, I don't think I can, I can answer what the United Nations would think about this, but I can certainly share my own thoughts. So, so uh, first of all, I, I think it's really that the idea to not just celebrate uh, uh, the earth and the environment uh, just for one day a year, but to do it for a longer period, I think that's a good idea because it allows one to do more activities uh, whatever they may be, whether it's species or whether it's uh, taking care of nature on the ground level or all kinds of activities. So I, I like the idea of, of moving from one day to, to one week. Now, the idea of, of humanity staying indoor for a week to let nature be outside and, and, and roam the streets, I think it sounds good, but I, I'm not sure if that is really going to work because how are you going to tell the animals okay this week you can come into the city but on saturday when we end the week then you have to go back you know so i, I i'm not sure that practically uh, that would work on the other hand i think it's so important to find ways to to give more space to nature so if during that week uh different uh, organizations and yes governments local governments can push for better protected areas better managed protected areas so that nature can really thrive in those areas and, and more protected areas, then I think we're getting somewhere. Some people have said that we need about half the earth to be in a natural habitat where nature can be the, uh, the in, it, in its fullness, uh, can be in charge, so to speak. And so let's use a week like that to push for uh, these these kinds of protected areas where we can uh, eventually achieve that kind of a goal and and then at the same time and this is so important for us I think we need to find ways to on the one hand yes increase protected areas but on the other hand reduce the pressure we're putting on these uh, natural areas uh, from our industrial economic activities and so on so let's find ways to increase efficiency of agriculture reduce food waste uh, move towards circular economy where we make use of all the resources and yes we must reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide but also we have already produced too much so the carbon that is in the atmosphere needs to be removed even if we stop all emissions today there's already too much carbon so we need to fix the old problems and, and then I think overall there will be less pressure on nature and ultimately that's the goal that we need to strive for. Well, absolutely, absolutely true. That is the goal for one week. My, the idea was to try not to get the, the, uh, the original inhabitants outside meant basically that nature should be allowed to heal. But, uh, but, but I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you gave your viewpoint and at an individual level, it's very important to reduce carbon emissions as much as at industries and, and governments. But let me take the same question to Sonakshi and, and end with that. Uh, Sonakshi, your thoughts on uh, for one week, one world? 
Uh, you know how strongly I feel about this, Ishab. I think uh, it, it's very important. In fact, I'd, I'd uh, go as far as saying uh, it should be one week every month <laughs> for the environment. <laughs> why, why just one week in a year, you know? I think um, yeah. I, I wanted to say that, you know, we need to restore the balance, but I feel like we've tipped it, you know, so far we've imbalanced it so badly now i just feel like it's it's going to take really long to come for it to come back to normal and honestly no matter how much we do right now um it's not going to be enough so we all have to get together as individuals uh, and try as much as we can because this is for our future generations this is for our generations as well and you know it's up to us this is not an act of god this is not an act of nature it is an act of human beings and it- if we have uh, been able to do this, I think that we should really get our act together and uh, restore it or at least, you know, make it better for, for our future generations. And for me, I'm, I'm available in any way that I can be. I want to be a part of this cause. I want to be a champion of the environment. And I want as many people, whoever, whoever is listening to this conversation today, to step up and also be a champion for the cause, you know. So I think it's very important on an individual level to really step up and do your bit. And Rishab, if you're going to suggest any more lockdowns, I think people are really going to start running after you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and that was... Uh, for uh, for all those who have been watching, thank you very much for for tuning in. But uh, honestly, just like the the good lady and the gentleman said, that there is no there is no planet B. There is only one planet, and it's a race that we must win. Uh, and it will only happen if all of us are in it together. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to host both Sunakshi Sinha and Mr. Yanos Pasta today for the climate change a race we must win panel discussion on behalf of everyone at imun thank you very much for joining us thank you thank you, thank you so much <laughs>